Anyway, you guys are here for Bob Hall, right? Yes. So before that happens, I want to just bring out my good friend, Ian Chase Nichols. And I can't say more than enough good things about this cat. And um, I love him to death, so I'm gonna leave him in your hands, treat him well. And Jamie and I are gonna go sit in a crowd. The sh show is all yours, my oh, friend. Thank you, I love you too. Love you back. <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, thanks for coming to the uh, comic panel with uh, a gentleman who has done the Avengers, Batman, all the licensed IPs that you can you can name, and he is a, a master storyteller. Uh, he has done theater. He has been a playwright. He's been an editor at Marvel. Um, he, you can go on Wikipedia and see the massive list of credits that he has under his belt. And he is just a tremendous artist with a deep well of knowledge. And I am selfishly here to steal some of that knowledge for my own use, um, even if. Uh, its use is, is minor uh, in comparison. So uh, I'm gonna use artistic terms. So if you have questions, please ask. You can just, we're here, it's a small group. You can raise your hand, I'm happy to call on you. Um, we're gonna talk comics, we're gonna have some fun, and uh, we hope you guys uh, enjoy it. And without further ado, Mr. Bob Hall. Making an entrance is weird, but that's okay. <laughs> All these mics live? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Good. Um, I'm going to stand because I've been sitting all day, so. What's your agenda? That sounds good. I, my agenda is just to ask you some questions we'll and you. tell some stories and we'll have some fun. Hopefully. Ask, ask me questions? Yeah. Um, you've life, it isn't good. Life, everything. Um, You've drawn hundreds of pages. Um, when you sit down to draw a page, whether it's you writing it as you write as for yourself or having someone else's script, what's the first thing that you do? Uh, gee, I work. Uh, I Xerox uh, standard comic book paper and reduce it down to uh, eight and a half by eleven usually four panels a page uh, and lay really the whole story out at that scale. And I work at that scale first because uh, uh, it's almost impossible to get involved in the details, which is sort of your enemy in laying out the whole story. You just want to be able to uh, put panels down and throw them away if it isn't working and, and, and start over. So working at that scale, I can lay, I lay out the whole book. And uh, then I uh, go back and begin to take what I've done and, and flesh it out. But, but that's really how I start. And uh, uh, depending on what it is, I'll either go to a eight and a half, I'm, I'm sorry, 11 by 17, um, anymore just using a copy paper of that size and try to be very gestural about laying something out. And then I put it on, this is, this is not working digitally, this is working the old way. And uh, then I'll, I'll use a light, a light box to do the final piece over that. Um, yeah, I work in a similar way where, you know, just to see the page in itself, because the page is very small. A lot of people think that you can fit anything onto a page. Like, it's true that in comics you can do a lot that, you know, that they've copied or tried to co-opt for movies. But on a page, working at print size, which is what he's describing, like the actual book, lets you solve a lot of visual problems, like where, where all the lettering goes. Like, you don't want speech balloons to be impossible to read, like clarity, structure, uh, pacing out. A whole, do you pace out the whole book? Do you do the thumbnails for the whole book before you start first page penciling? Yes. Uh Part of that is from having worked at Marvel as an editor, which I didn't do very long. I didn't particularly like being an editor, although I learned more about doing comics in those six months uh, 
than at any other time. But one of the things I learned is that there were certain artists, some very, very good ones, well, Gene Colan for one, who would start a book and do amazing page breakdowns with three, sometimes two panels per page, and they were really gorgeous, and then he would run out of room before the end of the book, <laughs> so the last, the last few pages would be filled with little panels, and, and I, I didn't want to do that, uh, so I, sometimes I work backwards. If, uh, if I know that there's a big climactic thing at the end, I'll maybe put that in, or I'll jump to various places in the book. I may not start right at page one. I may do key moments and then figure out how I'm, how I'm uh, filling that in between. Now, talking about laying out the balloons, it really depended on what method you were doing. So if you were using the quote Marvel method, um, which was that you got a scenario, you didn't get a script when I was working at Marvel. You'd get a scenario. Some writers would, would uh, just do a three-page synopsis of the whole book. I'm saying three pages. It could have been, I, Stan, I'm told, did some on one page. But I, doubt, I don't think I ever got one that was less than maybe three, four pages long. But uh, a lot of writers would go through still and page by page give you a scenario for that page. But unless they were very clear that I want the character at one point saying to be or not to be, that is the question or, or the equivalent, uh, they wouldn't give you the dialogue. Um, and they would write the dialogue after they saw the pictures, which meant that uh, the danger with that was that you wouldn't leave enough room for the balloons. The good thing was that it made that you probably didn't leave enough room for the balloons, so the writer had to write less and had to compress, which is good for comics. Compression is good for comics. Uh, and it was a very rich way of, of, of working, and, but you did have to be conscious that you were leaving some space for the, for the balloons to happen. The, the best thing about it was that you were very free to create what I think of as the stage business. Uh, what were the characters doing? Exactly what was happening in the scene that was addenda to... So you became somewhat like a movie director and it was a real collaboration so that you'd, you'd, get, the, you'd get the scenario but you were fleshing it out first and then the writer would flesh it out more. Uh, it meant that um, instead of... The writer could look at what you did and he may throw away a lot of exposition that he thought he had to put in and, and realize, oh, it's redundant to say Batman went down the stairs into the basement if I've shown you Batman going down the stairs into the basement. And then that gives the writer room. In the case of Stan, it gave him room for all the wisecracks in Spider-Man uh, and for Stan Lee himself to make comments, which uh, often, if you looked at earlier comics, there just wasn't room for that kind of stuff. Were those deadlines more stressful as an artist or an editor? Oh, uh, it, it was a very different thing as, a, as an artist. Uh, as an editor, I never stayed up till four in the morning trying to get anything done. <laughs> Whereas in, in an artist, I did it all the time. Because um, I was not the fastest person I was never a very fast artist. Uh, I could do about a book a month. You had to be able to do pencil a book in about two and a half weeks. And if you couldn't do it in two and a half weeks, it was going to be late. Because there was a, it was all an assembly line. So that you'd, you, when you think, and I think it's, when you think about it, it's miraculous that these things ever came out because you had, um, a writer would write the scenario, then it would go to the artist, the artist would, would pencil it, then it would go back to the writer who would write the dialogue, then it would go to the letterer who would letter it, then it would go to the inker. And 
finally to the colorist. Yeah. And um, even then, it wasn't done really because the um, uh, colors at that time were only a guide. Uh, the colorist would color something. Sometimes you'd see that there would be little YB, uh, Y2B3 or something that would indicate that uh, it was all coded to Dr. Martin's dye colors. So it would mean 2% yellow and a certain percentage of brown and uh, trying to describe what you had to do with the colors but that wasn't about mixing the colors that was how much yellow and how much I'm saying brown but that's inaccurate uh, cyan, cyan magenta and, and yellow and, and, and yellow yeah and and so that it was the four color process and it was shipped off to the printing press which would they would break it down into three colors plus black, and a certain percentage of red, uh, yellow, and, and, and blue, basically. And uh, uh, a, there was really some lovely, some of it was lovely, and sometimes it was just terrible. Sometimes it, had, it was very removed from the coloring you saw go through the office. Uh, but uh, a good colorist was, was they could do amazing things with that. We always talked about well, well the, I don't I don't know why even Marie Severin, who was in charge of coloring, would say, "I wonder if the little old ladies at Western Printing uh, will be able to read this." And uh, as near as anybody could tell, nobody had been to Western Printing, which was in I think Illinois, and. Uh, Nobody knew that if there were that there were any little old ladies working for the company, but that's what they always said. So. Does, does everyone know who Marie Severin is? She's a, she's an absolutely tremendous artist. Uh, she penciled, she inked, she colored, she worked on tons and tons of companies. I, I implore you to check out her work. Uh, do we have any questions? We've gone into some deep uh, terms. How do you feel about the changing styles from what you were how you were doing to now or? Um, as far as panel things, it was very dependent on what you could get away with and on editorial. There were some really uh, fantastic uh, panel stuff happening uh, all the time, and then there were some people, uh, some editors who really hated it, who wanted to you didn't see you do a grid. So that at one point when Jim Shooter took over, uh, I, w I was doing the Avengers and I laid out the book and uh, uh, Jim Sauerkraut, who was the editor, saying, uh, this isn't what we like anymore. This is what we used to like, but it's not what we like this week because, <laughs> because Jim wants everything done on a grid because he was convinced that kids could not read what he called crazy panels. Uh, and most, for the most part, I think most of us who were laying it out disagreed because we felt there, there, there are, you, you would, when I was an editor, you would see some people doing strange panels and re realized, no, this just, just doesn't read in a, you, you still had to read sequentially, but you can do a lot of interesting things and still read things sequentially. So I like that aspect of it I like. Um, on the other hand, as far as style is concerned, uh, there is really nothing you can do about it. Uh, you can try to adapt, but you will usually fail. There are some artists who are blessed with a style that seems universal, and it will, it will their whole career, they can do that style, and it will grow and be different. The uh, best example I can give is Norman Rockwell, the, the famous painter for Saturday Evening Post. And he had this endless career as an artist. And there's another guy who was his contemporary, and I can't think of his name right now, uh, but my 
daughter, who was a curator at a museum, did did a. He was from Nebraska, where I live now, and so they they did a showing about him. And you would see him about every five years trying to change his style to remain current. And and to some extent he succeeded, but to some extent he did not. So that. I feel my work has grown and adapted and looks very different than it did in the 19, early 1980s or 1970s. But people will still come by my, 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 my table and say, oh, I love the old school stuff. And I realize, well, no, that's what I do. I just have gotten, it's just, it's just better looking now than it was, but I'm probably doing what I would like to have done back then, I just am more able to do it now. Uh, but it probably is, I'm probably stuck, you know, I'm, I'm stuck in the 70s, I guess. But, but that's okay, you know, you, you have to accept that that's, that's what's gonna happen. It happens uh, to everybody. It happens like, uh, you know, how many kids today are fanatical about, about listening to the Beatles? You know, and, and uh, you know, you 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 get twenty years on, and 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 people have a different way of looking at things. Uh, Do you feel like uh, your work has evolved? But I always felt that different inkers gave you different dynamics. Like I always liked what John Beatty did, or you see what Brit Breeding did. Was there anything from those that maybe? Uh, affected how your work changed, or was it totally like self-taught or organic? Uh, uh, well, the, I think the big thing is that they were very good inkers. Yeah. And so um, the best inkers have their own style. And they, the, f the first inker that really tried to follow me that was really good was a guy named Frank Giacoya, who was a very, very old hand at inking, and he and he made me look at least competent. Uh, but but people like uh, Brett, uh, who had a kind of a um, Dick Giordano, uh, Bob Layton feel to his work, uh, had that style, and, yeah. it, and it looked. Wonderful. I told him today, though, I did uh, the West Coast Avengers, and the last issue I found it was getting a little bit more behind each issue because I was taking my time with it. <laughs> and the last issue, they said, well, can you get this done in a little faster? I said, well, why don't I do it in breakdown? And breakdown meant that you did a, a, a there were sometimes very loose breakdowns, but a complete breakdowns meant you did everything, but you didn't put in any black stuff. You did all the detail, but you did it all in line. And you would let the inker put in the blacks. Yeah. And I was embarrassed that when we gave that to Brett, I, to me it came back looking better than when I did <laughs> the tight pencils. And uh, that was something that happened. I would often try to do breakdowns, or Joe Rubenstein would, would sometimes call what I did shakedowns, meaning that I would, I would put in uh, a little bit more than a breakdown, but it still wasn't tight pencils. And uh, there were certain inkers that uh, made me look wonderful, like Tom Palmer. Tom Palmer's one of the best of all time. And uh, Bill Sienkiewicz inked me once, who's a, a master illustrator. And uh, they was completely their own style. And if I had done more, the tighter I had gotten, it would have been absurd because they were going to do their style. So the anchor does make a make a big a big big difference to what you do. And if you find somebody that you're compatible with and you really like what they do, I I, I sort of feel that one of my least strong things was being able to uh, pencil four anchors. Uh, when I ink my own stuff, I look at the pen, if I've done, if I, even if I've done tight pencils, I usually change everything because I start to ink it and say, I don't like this. That isn't how I want it to look. It gives, you, it gives you a do-over a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think my style is different in ink than it is in pencils. And it, it would be preferable if that were not the case, but it is the case. 
so I've, I've had I've had some very good very good inkers and, and some some that I think were pretty darn good but just didn't follow what I was doing and I think that was my fault not theirs we got another question over here Harley Quinn Um, generally, when that happens, they want to see different styles. And uh, I did it for Marvel a couple of times in, oh, what's his name? He was in uh, uh, Ragnarok, the, the games master guy. Uh, yeah. they, they did a whole series. The Grandmaster? The Grandmaster, yes. yeah. They yeah. had a whole series of Grandmaster things, and they would have different artists do different chapters. And part of, part of the fun was supposed to be seeing how different uh, artists uh, handled the material in the same uh, thing. And, and I'm, the book that I'm doing now, this four-page thing, is part of a, a book that's set up that way with all kinds of different people working on it. and. Uh, I made sure before I, I did it that, that what he wanted to see was my take on the characters, um, not not and not have me imitate somebody else's style. Now that means still that I would try to get the costumes accurately, but they would be my stylistic version of it, which is a little hard to explain. But but even just how you you've got a character who's all black and you make him. Some, some artists will do them, do them entirely as a silhouette. Some, a lot, most of us will do it leaving kind of a shiny thing. Uh, but how you accomplish that can be very, very different between different artists. So, and, it, and it's still the same costume. It still would be Superman with a symbol and perhaps wearing red trunks or perhaps not. <laughs> um. Was there a lot of inner interactivity with your different collaborations? Were there people that you'd be on the phone with a long time or uh, in the yeah. office with? Or? Never. No? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I find it almost embarrassing, at least from that era, to be called the co-creator of uh, the West Coast Avengers. Given that we were working uh, in the Marvel method, I suppose I was because I contributed to a book that was a script that wasn't finished yet. Yeah. But the way it worked was that Roger Stern went and pitched the idea to the editor, who I can't remember who it was at this point, and the editor said, okay, and they said, who shall we get? And I'm sure they said John Byrne or George Perez, and they said, they're not available, what about Hall? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so I ended up doing it and would do the pencil breakdowns, and if Roger had not liked them, they would probably have sent them back, but he seemed to like them, so we had very little communication about it, uh, other than that, uh, because I liked working with Roger, uh, uh, I suggested that if... Uh, Roger Stern, just Roger to clarify. Stern, yeah, Roger Stern, and I was, uh, the comics at that time were 22 pages, and I said, gee, if you'll write 20 pages if you, as you break it down and give me two pages to play with, you'll be very happy. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of times um, writers would, in, in doing this scenario thing, one of the things that would, especially if they were doing a page by page, they would describe action sequences and because there wasn't a lot of dialogue in them or, or that, that they were thinking about they would have something happen in one page that really should have been two or three pages. Yeah, and that goes back to the pages being smaller, even than by what writers who work in comics sometimes get. And you know, when he's working from saying he's working from the Marvel method, his co-creation is dictating the entire pace of the story. Like each page turn, every reveal, every surprise that you as a reader get, he's the one giving it to you in that in those instances. So. Um, but, oh, we got a Lou yes. has a question. What was your easiest character to write for and draw? Well, I, I I started 
um, the first thing that I wrote in Andrew was a shadow man for Valiant. And uh, that one was, well, let me describe how I, I got it. I was, uh, I don't know why I never got into writing comics. I, I had written for the theater and uh, I collaborated with uh, a writing partner named David Richmond who has passed away now, but we, we wrote a version of Dracula and it, and it ran off Broadway for a couple of years. And Jim Shooter had seen it. And so he would say, you know, why didn't you write comics? And I said, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And, but I, I wanted to, to work for Valiant. And uh, called him up and he said, well, we don't really need artists right now. We're desperate for writers. Uh, why don't you pick? I said, I'll, I'll give you, and it's finally time for you to write something. I'll give you a, a choice of five different titles. You pick one and go for it. And Shadow Man was sort of a failed book. Um, there had been, conceptually it was fine. Uh, it was set in New Orleans about somebody, something happens to him at night and he becomes, it was sort of a Jekyll and Hyde thing except that he didn't become a monster at night. He became, uh, it was, he was a fine musician by day and then he became reckless and uh, stronger and all kinds of stuff at night, but nobody knew quite what. And uh, his costume was kind of awful. It looked like he was wearing blue Dr. Denton uh, <laughs> and, uh, and wearing a mask that you, you know he couldn't have breathed in that mask. And, and uh, that's why I decided I would do that one because that there had been, uh, I think, six issues, four or five different artists, and at least two, maybe three writers. I think there had been three writers on it. And so it was, no, it was nobody owned the book, and it was not going anywhere. And I thought if I, for a first try at writing a comics, it would be, um, if I failed, I would be in good company. And if I succeeded, I'd look pretty good. And uh, it was also set off in a corner of the Valiant universe. And it was a very individual character book, which uh, I liked as well. And I loved the idea of New Orleans and thought, hey, if this thing really works, I'll get to go to New Orleans. And uh, so that's what I did. And we I was allowed to reinvent the character. I didn't reboot him, really. I, I just decided that the character himself would decide that he wanted to wear different, that he didn't like his outfit and he, he would alter it and alter, uh, and that since nobody seemed to know exactly what his powers were, that that became his powers, that things would come and go and, and he would try to get a handle on what was happening to him, but, but it was always, always a little different and it, he would be surprised by something and then he couldn't repeat it and I thought, well, that's interesting because rather than a character that was set in stone, you had a character that was malleable and, and uh, uh, that, you, that you could play, uh, you could play what if with a character. Uh, and it's, it's easier to play what if with a character like that than with a character like Superman who, um, you always end up with what if I could find a different way of delivering kryptonite, you know, so it's, it's you're more locked in. Um, so he became the easiest character to write, and I felt eventually I knew I knew how he talked. I was inside him and did it for uh, I think three years. I had a three-year run on it. And that was that was so that was fun. What did you feel about the TV show? I did not watch it. Well, good for you. <laughs> no, I I left it, and I, I never really wanted to deal with it again because. Uh, acclaim, Valiant was called Valiant, and then they sold the company, and by the time I uh, turned in my first story arc, Jim was gone, uh, he'd, been, he'd been forced out because he didn't want to sell the company, he wanted to do comics, and his partners, all, all a lot of money was being made in, in comics in the 90s, 
it was a big collector's market, and they wanted to write it and walk away with a big payday. And so they sold it to Acclaim Gaming. And Acclaim Gaming basically wanted to, well, the, the president of the company got us all together one time, but those of us, by that time I was living in New York, and, and, and uh, again, and, and we all went into the office, and then he made a spiel that what he wanted was to uh, have us create icons that could be made into games. And I don't remember this, but I had a lunch with a bunch of valiant people, and they say, yeah, you're the one that, that spouted off and said, yeah, but if we don't tell good stories, the company's going to go under. <laughs> and, and so apparently I did, and uh, that, that eventually is what happened. But one symptom of it was that one day I got called into editorial and been told, you know, you're doing the character wrong. And I said, yeah. And he said, yeah, he's, he's a black guy. And I said, well, no, he's a Creole. It's a very particular culture. I said, There's, there were all kinds of African-American characters in the book, but Jack, as created, when I, when I took it over, he was, it was clear he was a Creole. And they said, no, no, he's, he's black. And I went home to digest that. And somewhere in the middle of the night, I said, ah, got it. They want to make a game out of this. And they've done the demographics and decided that uh, that an African-American character would, would sell better. So I, I, I went in and said, um, look, I will find a way to wind up this character, Jack Boniface, in the next five issues. Give me five issues. I'll wind it up. I'll end it with some way that you can do what you want. You can kill him. You can whatever. But and then and then reboot it with with the character that you want, which is which is what happened. And I he was uh, it was put part of the fun though of playing What If because. One of the things I was saddled with is that before I took it over, there was this happening called Unity, and in that, it was all the characters got together. And it I, was I a giant over crossover. Just, just, I, just, I took over just after that, and uh, this character, Jack, Shadow Man, had found out that he was supposed to die in 1999. This was being 1993. And so when I decided, when I decided I would wind up that part of the series. I played the what if of what if you knew you were going to die in 1999 and uh, or that you had to stop in five minutes uh, with the panel which somebody's holding up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so I decided that I would give him a nervous breakdown and in the last issue he decides he has to know if he can die before 1999 and he he climbs the tallest building in New Orleans and jumps off. And I left him halfway down at the end of the at the end of the book and thought, I know how he can get out of this. Or you can make him go splat, whatever you want to do. But there you have it. <laughs> and as far as I know, he's still he's still there in midair trapped. And I actually sold them I sold him the solution. Uh, Dinesh uh, who who bought the new Valiant uh, at one time wanted to do in a compendium the story of what really what really happened and I was going to say okay well I'll, I'll let him live then but they decided they didn't want to do anything that that smacked of the old they changed their mind they didn't want to do anything that smacked of the 90s value so anyway well, I do, think we're we have done to, do we have, well I mean we, we at least have to mention that because I, mean, I can ask you questions all day but uh, the, I don't think they'll let you do that. Yeah, um, but we have to mention that uh, Mr. Hall uh, has an art rep called Catskill Comics, and you can go to their website. He has originals there. You can commission beautiful, complete commissions of your favorite characters, Shadow Man, anything he's worked on. Um, and uh, we're right down on Artist Alley A65, I believe is where I'm at, and Bob's right across from me. So and thank you very much for coming. And Thank you, Bob, for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. Right. And, and, if, and if you happen to be in Lincoln, Nebraska in April, I'm going to play King Lear. There, I just thought to throw that in just to confuse people. <laughs>